Absolutely. Now, for those that have just recently joined, we are now about 51 and a half minutes away from launch. The clock continues to count down to the launch of AX3. So let's share some of the highlight, highlights of the day that got us to where we are now. Exactly. So crew wrapped up their quarantine phase, um, taking a flight from their quarantine facility at Kennedy over to Kennedy Space Center. You can see them there on the helicopter as they think about their flight and pass over the Cape. And what I think is really cool about this is they get to see their vehicle from hits, from this perspective too as they come in, right? Yeah. And at this point, you know, they're going to touch down, they're thinking about their mission, and then they get to wave to their families. They get to see, they haven't seen them in so long. They get to wave to them, have a final goodbye. And at this point, this is where we really hand over to SpaceX to complete the rest of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Man, look at those smiles. Everyone is excited, as they should be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so after they arrive and after they're handed over to the crew, um, they go through a series of events such as putting their suits on. Obviously, they take a ride up to, oh, here we can see there. Uh, this is the moment where they walked out of the Falcon support building. This is where our SpaceX suit up room is located. They stand here, do another wave. <laughs> um, really, this was the first opportunity that we, we got to see the crew in their suits today got in those Teslas uh, and drove up to the launch pad, which is about roughly a half mile away from where those doors are. Um, I'm always curious what music they're listening to oh, yeah. um, during this ride. Uh, you can see here that they are pulling up to the launch pad, um, two Teslas. We have the crew split in half there with some closeout team members uh, that obviously help, help support them. We lovingly refer to them as the ninjas um, <laughs> because we see them all around assisting the crew in things like in getting into or ingressing the capsule. Um, so here, this is one of my favorite moments of launch day it, when they get to see their rocket up close um, and man, just thinking about the fire that's going to come out at the bottom there uh, <laughs> in just under an hour. Yeah, and at this point, you can see our commander and our pilot walking down, as well as Marcus and Alper to their Dragon capsule before they get in. Yeah, so at this point in time, that side hatch is closed. We had the post ingress crew briefing and we heard great news that we heard that the weather is looking good i think the exact words were uh weather is great and that everything is healthy so both uh falcon 9 and dragon vehicles are ready to go to space just like the crew excellent recap cape all right well it's important to remember that this crew has not walked this path to flight alone earlier today they waved to their friends and family before suiting up as we just saw but that wasn't the first round of cheers that their families had for them to the whole crew of Axiom, mission number three. This is the SOG flight test team that would like to wish you a safe and fantastic journey up to the International Space Station. Hello from Turkey. Have a safe space flight. Good luck. Ciao, Ciao papà, buon viaggio. Siamo con te, amore. Siamo tanto orgogliosi di te, papà. Ti vogliamo bene. bene. Ciao. Greetings, Commander Mike and AX3 crew from your ASTM family here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Your dedication to exploration and discovery inspires us all. Enjoy every second of it. Make us dream. We're all coming with you. Yolun açık olsun Alperim. Ed Astra. Que acuérdate de saludarnos desde allá arriba, desde alguna de las ventanitas. Y nada, aquí estaremos esperándote con los brazos abiertos para cuando vuelvas. Un besito. Congratulations, Alper. We're excited for your opportunity to go into space. Have a good and prosperous time there and get back to Earth safely. We wish you the best of luck and have fun on this life-changing mission. Hey, X3 crew. Listen, you guys are about to have a lot of fun. Be sure you get in the cupola a lot. Call home, actually call all your friends, and just be sure you tie your sleeping bag down well. I ended up somewhere else one day. It was a hoot. Anyway, have fun, Ad Astra, enjoy. See you when you get back.
Yeah, those are pretty wise words from John Schaffner there from uh, AX2. Uh, yeah, it's just so fun to see everybody's cheers. Uh, space really is for everyone, mm -hmm. um, including everyone that loves the people going to space. So. Airplane operators on countdown. Pulling is complete. Both Dragon and Falcon teams have pulled go for launch escape arm, propellant load, and launch. Stand by for abort instructions. Uh, T minus 45 minutes. Uh, both control rooms go into lockdown and remain in that state until the launchscape system is disarmed. All operators are to remain at their console and maintain a sterile cockpit until MD confirms successful disarming of launchscape system following orbit insertion or propellant offload in the event of a scrub. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and they will approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into launch abort. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. Launch control at this time. You may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. Launch control copies proceeding with arming crew arm for movement. Well, there you heard it. We are go to proceed with propellant load in just under 10 minutes. Crew arm retract has started. And we are beginning to retract that crew access arm. Both the Falcon 9 and Dragon are go for launch. Wow, great view of that on your screen right now. Um, and in a moment, we should hear some additional directions from our launch director to the team. Now, of course, the crew is currently on board, again, with that great view of the crew access arm moving away from Dragon. They're at historic launch pad 39A. So now the range continues to be go for launch and we're monitoring the clearance area around the launch pad as well as air and sea space around the flight corridor. Even though we have been keeping an eye on some possible storm cells near the launch site, the conditions are predicted to be acceptable for launch. Downrange landing zones if needed for an escape are also go. Now the full retraction of that crew access arm is expected to take about two minutes and will be followed almost immediately with the arming of the launch escape system. Crew arm retraction is complete. There is confirmation that that's complete. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Kate. Thanks, Ronnie. As we heard, the crew access arm is, out of the, is now uh, moved out of the way. It is in its uh, launch configuration. This is one of the last physical changes to the pad that we will see prior to the liftoff of the AX3 crew. Uh, the next milestone that we have coming up will be arming of the launch escape Dragon system. SpaceX, with that, you are go for section six, close visors and arm launch escape system. SpaceX Dragon in work. All right, so right now the crew is activating the launch escape system. Um, They're using the tablets there, uh, the touch screen in front of them. Uh, this is the system is the first of its kind escape system. It provides the escape capability all the way to orbit. Uh, you know, it is our SpaceX Dragon visors closed, arming launch escape system. SpaceX copies. We take every measure possible to ensure the crew has options at all times, including an escape in the worst of scenarios. Um, it is our most solemn duty to make sure the crew gets home to their families. And we're here now seeing the, uh, the like we said, the crew is activating the launch escape system. If engaged, it would utilize the Super Draco engines, which are basically extra powerful versions of the Draco engines that Draco uses while on orbit. So uh, generally speaking, we don't want to activate the Super Dracos, but they're there in case if necessary. So launch escape, launch escape system arming is now underway, uh, but let's talk a little bit about the control rooms that we are launch operating. Launch escape system is verified armed. Uh, 
All right, there we heard the call out telling us that that launch escape system is now activated. So here, this is our mission control center in uh, here just behind us actually in uh, at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We also have launch control um, at firing room four at Cape Canaveral. That team is responsible for monitoring Falcon 9 throughout the countdown and the launch. Uh, where, whereas here, mission control is responsible for close monitoring of the crew and Dragon every step of the way uh, as the spacecraft orbits the planet along its customized flight path. On console or uh, on headset, as we say, are a number of key positions who are monitoring the health of the vehicle and the crew. The mission director, call sign MD, as you'll hear uh, out on the nets, that person's responsible for mission success and is in charge of the room. You'll also hear a specific role dedicated to communicating to the AX3 crew. We've heard from this individual a couple of times already today. This is Jake Vendel today. Uh, this is the crew operations and resource engineer, call sign core on the nets. The other positions are focused on things like software, propulsion, navigation, avionics, life support systems, and ultimately communications with the ground segments. SpaceX team members will also rotate on and off to ensure that we have 24 seven coverage of crew and Dragon for the entire duration of the mission, all the way through splashdown. So fun fact, we also have a crew um, supporting the NASA Crew 7 team in a uh, uh, an adjacent control room okay. just next door to this one. Um, so yeah, we have 24 seven coverage for all Dragons up at the space station. That's awesome, Kate. And you know, on that note for Axiom Space, Teams in Houston, as you can see there, coordinate mission support at Axiom Mission Control Center, or MCCA, as you can see on your screen. MCCA is an officially certified control center joining the large network of other control centers, like you just mentioned, Kate, uh, that support ISS from all over the world. From this secure facility, teams have live access to voice, video, data, all of that streaming from the ISS and can work alongside their NASA counterparts to run on-orbit preparations and monitor every aspect of the mission in real time, 24-7, for the duration of the mission. Now, this room is led by what we call an Axel, or Axiom Operations Lead. And around the room are also additional supporting flight controller positions that are each responsible for different aspects of mission support. That includes things like research, communications, medical, integration and stowage, and timeline operations. This is a significant step in our journey to expand access to low Earth orbit, as it is only the 12th ground segment partner for the ISS program. And through this facility, we are providing our customers and the global community a front row seat to the work being done on station. Yeah, as you can tell by the names like Core and Axel, these yeah. are really important roles and mm -hmm. everything else kind of flows around yeah. them as the center point in those uh, leading those operations, whether it's on the Axiom side or the SpaceX side. So uh, as we await our T0 in just under 39 minutes from now, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure both the Dragon and Falcon are ready for launch. Let's take a look at what the ascent portion of today's mission will look like. Once we hit T minus zero, we'll watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A, which you have a great view of right now, and begin to make their ascent. At about 43 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help us pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as max Q. It's worth noting that once we hit max Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic or faster than the speed of sound. Once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our Merlin engines again. From there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin engines shut off in preparation for stage separation. Stage separation is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth for landing as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event. That second engine start one, or SES-1, where the Merlin vacuum engine on board stage Expect two. Expect loud venting from the vehicle in 30 seconds. Where the engine on stage two lights up and propels the second stage, along with our AX-3 crew and Dragon, into orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute three burns in order to make its way back to Earth. The first is the boost back burn, where three of the Merlin 1D engines will reignite and shut down. This heads the first stage back to Cape, back to Cape Canaveral. The second burn, or the entry burn, helps slow the stage down in preparation. Falcon 9 tanks are venting for the start of propellant load. 
second burn or entry burn helps to slow the stage down in preparation for that entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. And about 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn will bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land back on land near the launch site um, about eight minutes into the mission. And while that first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. Then, Dragon will begin preparations to separate from the second stage. About three minutes after the second stage reaches orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from stage two. Once Dragon is, is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. The nose cone deploy sequence will initiate just before T plus 12 minutes and then finish around T plus 15 minutes. This will expose Dragon's docking mecha mechanism in advance of its arrival at the International Space Station. For us, these Dragon missions are important for safely flying astronauts so they can conduct scientific research and other activities in space, but also because they are laying the foundation for the future where more people from more countries all around the world will have an opportunity to travel to space, whether it's low Earth orbit, the Moon, Mars, or beyond. In the history of human spaceflight, less than 700 people have ever been to orbit. At SpaceX, we want to help create a future where not just hundreds of people, but thousands and ultimately millions of people can travel off Earth to live and work in space and on other planets. Last year, we flew six Dragon missions. This year, we could launch up to eight missions, including five or six human spaceflight missions, and that's Repellent only going... Repellent load has started. All right, right now we just heard the call at Falcon 9 has begun loading its propellants, uh, liquid oxygen and RP-1 rocket grade kerosene. So good news there. Um, as I was saying, uh, this year that could include five or six human spaceflight missions and that's only going to increase in the future. Thus far, we've only launched crew missions from Launch Complex 39A, which is what you see on your screen now. However, to support our growing manifest of Dragon missions, we've recently made some new upgrades to our other Florida launch pad, Space Launch Complex 40, which you see there with a brand new crew access arm being lifted. We're on our way to having two launch pads capable of supporting human spaceflight missions, meaning we'll have more opportunities to fly people on Dragon to orbit. If you're interested in helping us advance the future of human spaceflight and potentially fly on a future Dragon mission, check out spacex.com slash human spaceflight to learn more. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the training that the crew has gone through in order to be ready for this mission. Altogether, the Axiom 3 mission crew spent about 35 days training inside Dragon, and crew members individually received additional training specific to their role, learning SpaceX protocols, ISS systems, and preparing for the science and outreach activities that they'll be conducting while in space. Private astronaut training is rigorous. To prepare the AX3 crew for their mission, our teams here at SpaceX have spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in microgravity, and running simulations of full missions from inside our Dragon training capsules. The training program includes nearly 100 different lessons covering all aspects of flight. And if you're thinking it's kind of hard to tell what's the true training and what's the real capsule, that's true, because yeah. they're, they're pretty much identical, and that's the point. The team also spent time at the launch pad in the suit up room and working through emergency procedures that would be necessary in the unlikely event of a pad abort scenario. So let's take a further look at this crew in action. Exactly, the crew spent extensive amounts of training time in historic Building 9 at the Johnson Space Center, learning from certified instructors on all critical systems necessary to ensure a successful stay aboard the orbiting laboratory. The team even prepared for unlikely emergencies, like you mentioned, Kate, and learned how to provide first aid in a microgravity environment. Additionally, they learned how to prepare food and make selections for their meals, as well as how to, as learning other mission control um, positions and how mission control operates to better ensure that mission success during their flight. They also had a chance to familiarize themselves with the gear that will enable them to document their trip, their research, and help them connect with those back on Earth during their outreach events. ESA and JAXA also played a critical role in cruise training. Each module on orbit has its own nuances, so gaining insight into the specialties of their racks and modules is necessary, especially for this mission. 
extensive training on station navigation, on-orbit familiarization, emergency response, and repetition of walking through processes and procedures all help the crew maximize every second that they have during their flight. Simulating science research, operations, and even discussing how to sleep in space are all necessary lessons on the path to mission readiness. Now, the National Outdoor Leadership School, or NOLS, provides very unique Earth-based experience for many astronauts before they fly. This is a really a bonding experience for the crew. It can't be overstated how much teamwork factors into every aspect of their flight together. And this training in particular aims to thoroughly establish that. They also focus on survival skills, resilience, leadership, equally as important as followership, and overall teamwork to ensure they really are more than just passengers on the same rocket. The camping and outdoor adventure provides a solid foundation for the team to build on throughout their training. Knowles was definitely a highlight of this crew's preparation and training, and you can hear it in their voices and see it on their faces when they talk about their bond with each other. Now, you can't truly experience flying into space until you fly into space. <laughs> but some really unique tools have been developed to provide the closest experience possible. An altitude chamber can challenge the body with oxygen deprivation in a controlled and safe manner, Stage while human size... helium load has started. While human-sized centrifuges send the crew members for a spin to simulate the G-forces that they'll experience on launch and re-entry. It can be a bit nauseating, but it does help the crew know exactly what to expect on launch day. Now, at the end of it all, a mission patch is celebrated and it is hung in a tradition since the earliest days of spaceflight. So fittingly, as AX-3 heads to the International Space Station, the crew had the chance to be present for the patch hanging ceremony of their mission patch in Building 9 on that module in Johnson Space Center. Spaceflight is a serious business, but moments of levity and celebration like this help everyone pause and reflect on the incredible accomplishments being achieved every day. No matter how many patches join a canvas like this one, each one is incredibly special because of the people who make it possible, the crew and those here on Earth supporting each mission. So now for more on each crew member's portfolio, we're going to send you out to the Kennedy Space Center with Sonia Gavankar McKay, the Axiom Space Director of Digital Strategy, who is joined by Axiom's Chief Scientist, Dr. Lucy Lowe. Building on the success from AX-1 and 2, now 3 has over 30 experiments and some of them returning customers. Lucy, good to have you back. This is one of my favorite parts of the pre-launch broadcast because we get to talk about all the science that's happening. There's so much happening. It's over 350 hours of research, Absolutely. which is great. But do we think like this This is going to help us here on Earth? Does it really? Absolutely. So everything the crew is doing, it has huge benefits, not only for space flight and advancing exploration goals for humanity, but a lot of the research they're doing is really based on benefiting humans down here on Earth, whether it's healthcare, medicine, different kinds of technology applications. Everything they're doing has really tangible benefits to science and technology back down here on Earth. If you had to summarize each of the country's portfolios, how would you do that? Italy. Give me some Italy, words. They are doing doing some fantastic technical applications for the Italian Air Force, mm -hmm. uh, and they are doing uh, some really advanced biomedical research as well with some uh, of their companies that they're working with. Excellent. Turkey, it's all about bringing all of Turkey together. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. Turkey has a truly national portfolio. They have everyone across the country getting involved, uh, from researchers at universities all the way down to school children. ESA and Sweden, what's their portfolio looking like? ESA has a very strong focus on uh, research for advancing technology for exploration. So they have lots and lots of really cool technology demonstrations that are going to help human exploration in space in future. And tech demos as well. Is, do, you, do you, as chief scientist, is that tech demos a different thing or is it then research or all part of the same wonderful pot? They're very much part of the same pot. So all the technology demonstrations that take place are built on a lot of research and they often feed into future research that will take place to keep crew safe or to benefit human health here on Earth. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit de deeper, starting with Italy. They have the ISOC services for the ISS. Tell me a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so this is a project from the Italian Air Force, which is the Italian Space Operations Center, mm -hmm. where they've developed some software that's actually going to be analyzed debris in space which is a huge problem it's a huge problem we need to know where stuff is going and stuff is flying so that we can make sure that the space station is out of the way of those kinds of impacts so that software is also going to be doing some space weather forecasting to help keep crew safe in future space weather forecasting yes looking at different kinds of space weather from solar flares for mm. example that can actually release damaging radiation that can not only damage human cells but can also damage the electronics in a spacecraft so you want to avoid that when you can B makes sense beta amyloids aggregation updated yes. this is and this is about alzheimer's 
Exactly, research. exactly. So beta amyloid is a protein that aggregates together, it forms clumps, it forms amyloid plaques that are found in the brains of humans with Alzheimer's. Hmm. If we can understand how those aggregates form better, which we can use microgravity to really investigate that, then we can gain insights into Alzheimer's disease and how this terrible neurodegenerative disease can form or potentially how we could even treat it. And you talked about that weather forecasting, which is part of radiation. That's a big part. So briefly tell me about the Italian portfolio with, with radi radiation research. Exactly. So they have got some uh, light ion detector soft uh, hardware that they have uh, built that is going to be uh, analyzing the real-time radiation risk from this kind of space weather. And we also have some companies that have got some advanced materials that they've developed that is uh, designed to shield from some of this radiation in future. Okay, let's talk about the country of Turkey's research portfolio, the Turkish Space Agency, otherwise known as TUA. They have 70 types of diseases that they're going to be researching with AI technology? Yes, so they have a really cool project called Vocal Cord, okay. which has developed, uh, it's an easy-to-use telemedicine application where the crew actually cough or speak or make vocal noises into an iPad for recordings, and the AI software is then actually able to analyze that and can be used to detect or diagnose infectious diseases infectious diseases, uh, potentially even cardiovascular diseases in future. Wow. Very cool. Partnerships are a big deal with Axiom Space. All of these countries are partners with us, and Turkey is working with JAXA on one of their research projects. Tell me about that one. Exactly. So they're working on a very cool project using the JAXA's electromagnetic levitating facility, where they are melting and then re-solidifying some metal alloys in a way that the, the metal alloy floats in space, wow. so which helps us understand more about the molecular structure of these alloys and helps us understand understand more about materials research, that we can then take that knowledge and apply that to industry back down here on Earth. And ESA and Sweden looking way into the future. Their research is focused on humans in long-term space situations. Tell me about their research projects. Exactly. So one of their projects is called Orbital Architecture, which is a really fun one. They're investigating what the effect of the uh, very busy and crowded environment of the International Space Station is, not only on crew uh, cognitive function, but also on the crew stress responses uh, and also their neural responses. So yes, as you can see, that the ISS is, is very, very busy. Up we there. were talking about that. It's, it <laughs> seems very crowded. It's very crowded. So this investigation is going to be understanding in different parts of the space station, for example, if you look out the window, if your stress response goes down, do you then perform better in space? And how can we then apply those technologies, not only for future space flight, but also for engineering and building design back down here on Earth? There's also a great one on Simon. Now, my question is, Simon, is it more like HAL or TARS? So it's a uh, bit more like TARS okay, because, good. because okay. I'm a big fan of the Martian. But uh, yeah, so Simon is the crew interactive mobile companion. Here he is flying through space. So uh, this is an AI guided tool that is free flying on station that can help crew with tasks while they're up there. So it's actually going to be helping Marcus do a physical sciences investigation for ESA while he's up on station. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lucy. And I look forward to hearing about the post experience and post-mission research findings. Thank you so much. Always fascinating. Back to you all at Hawthorne. John, how's it going out there? It's going great, Sonia. Thank you very much for that. You know, hearing all that different research really kind of cements how important and unique each mission yeah. is, right? Each mission has its own suite of research. It has its own crew that makes up that mission. And mission patches really are a way of showing that symbolism and showing how unique that is, right? So they end up everywhere. There's one in that Dragon capsule. There's a few in that Dragon capsule now, I think, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but they end up in white rooms. They end up on orbit. They end up um, on laptops and notebooks. It's a very big deal for crew to be central in helping design this patch because it's such a lasting mark of their dedication and hard work. And the AX3 crew has put their mark on spaceflight history with the AX3 mission patch. All four astronauts are highlighted by their names, a star, and unique graphics for each nation that they represent. With the commander, Michael Lopez Alegria, holding dual citizenship, five national flags mark the top edge. The destination, the International Space Station, is the anchoring element in the middle. And interesting to note, the ISS resembles pilot's wings. So it should be no surprise, given that all four members are indeed pilots. Along the bottom of the patch, we see the mission's motto, the phrase plus ultra, in Latin meaning further beyond. So together, all of this builds on the mission's theme of exploration and its slogan, exploring further without borders. Yeah, like you said, they do end up everywhere. My personal favorite place is there inside the capsule. Um, there's two patches in there, one from the Crew-4 mission and one, of course, from the AX-2 mission, which also mm. took this capsule to space. So um, I think it's safe to say that we're going to be flying so much that we are going to potentially <laughs> run out of space for patches. <laughs> put them on the back of the seats, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Now the SpaceX teams have uh, teams all across, or SpaceX has teams all across the country supporting our missions in key roles, uh, and they're lo and they're in key locations such as our mission director, our core or crew operations and resource engineer, which you see there on your screen now. Um, and, and these people are very important. Um, we we keep talking about the countdown, and this launch countdown is the framework that syncs all of these teams up together. It's incredibly important. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We've heard a lot of that today, right? As we're talking, we're hearing these these loops or nets, right, of every of all these flight controllers talking. That's because communication is key. The entire mission from launch on orbit all the way back down to splashdown is a tightly choreographed dance between all of those parties and that's where communication comes in. For sure. It's pre uh, precise communication specifically is paramount throughout the mission in order to be successful, not just for today and on the way to the station, but continually for the next two weeks all the way through splashdown. Like I mentioned before, we have a, 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 a another team supporting the capsule that's on station for mm -hmm. Crew 7. So yeah, it's all the way through until the mission is complete. Exactly. And highlighting that communication, you see those two teams just on your screen there. Those are two of the many that work together. So to help facilitate that calm, Axiom Space is connected with that entire network of participants through MCCA in Houston, our mission control center at Axiom headquarters. That's what you see on the right there. And from SpaceX, NASA, and other international space agencies and researchers, we can talk together. So their team's monitoring and participating in this mission around the world, including mission controllers in Japan and across Europe. When you all add it up, it really is a truly international endeavor. Yeah. Now, speaking of international, let's check back in with International Space Station Mission Control Center at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Courtney, how are things looking over there? Hey, Kate, the space station team here in Houston is focused on the critical systems on the station, all continuing to function as expected ahead of launch. The teams have verified the command path from the ground up through our constellation of communication satellites to the station, and everything is looking good, and the station will be ready to receive Dragon Saturday morning. Now, once the AX-3 crew arrives at the station, there will officially be seven nations aboard the station. They will be greeted by the expedition 70 crew, NASA astronauts Andy Mogensen, Jasmine McBelly, and Laurel O'Hara, Roscosmos cosmonauts Konstantin Borisov, Oleg Kononenko, and Nikolai Chub, and JAXA astronaut Satoshi Furukawa. And once Dragon is fully docked to the station, the team here in Houston will assist the Axiom Space and Space Station astronauts with leak checks as they work to open hatches on both the Dragon side and inside the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch opening to take place approximately two hours after docking. Flight directors Diane Daly and Diana Trujillo are on console now, leading flight controllers for launch, and flight director Judd Freeling will lead teams for docking on Saturday. Mission Control in Houston is go for launch. Now with that, let's connect with Sonia at Kennedy Space Center. All right, for those of you that have recently tuned in, we are now within 20 minutes until the launch of AX-3 to the International Space Station. Officially, T minus 18 minutes on the dot. Uh, we've had a pretty clean countdown so far today. As I mentioned before, this launch countdown is the framework that syncs everybody together. We have teams in Houston, here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, um, uh, of course, at the Cape itself, um, firing room four, and everything is proceeding nominally. Uh, the reports that we heard earlier during the post-crew uh, ingress uh, briefing was that the weather was great, although we can see here on our screen a little cloudy, but we see some blue skies through there, so love to see that. 
We also heard that the team was working no major issues. Both Falcon and Dragon remained healthy. At uh, T minus, I believe it was 35 minutes. Yeah, T minus 35 minutes, we began prop load or propellant loading. Um, we now see some of these white clouds billowing from the vehicle. This is totally normal during this propellant load phase. Uh, we are currently loading our super chilled, uh, also known as densified liquid oxygen excuse me, liquid oxygen onto the vehicle as well as rocket grade kerosene or RP-1. We will continue to see these clouds kind of forming um, and we'll get even more of them right um, after the, those uh, closeout lines complete at T minus three and two minutes when both the first and second stages complete all of its propellant loading. Like I said, everything continues to look great. The crew is currently strapped into their seats. There's a five-point safety harness. You can think of it like a seatbelt, but it's a little bit more advanced than that. Actually, we see a live view of the crew there waiting so patiently <laughs> as we are getting... All right, so there we heard that call out that stage two LOX load has initiated. That is that super chilled liquid oxygen being loaded onto the Falcon 9 second stage, which of course is the part of the rocket just below that black and white trunk section that we see there on screen. So the crew, um, we there uh, at this particular view, the person on the far left is Marcus Want, one of our mission specialists. To his right is pilot Walter Villade. To his right is Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, or MLA, and on the very far right, Mission Specialist Albert Izarauche. Um, fun fact for today's flight, it is the first time that we have a repeat flyer on Dragon. That's at Commander MLA. He flew on the Axiom 1 mission, and uh, it's so exciting to see him flying once again in Dragon today. He's pretty much an expert at this point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for that update, Kate. And now for an update from Sonia Gavankar McKay at Kennedy Space Center with Deputy Administrator, Deputy Administrator Bill Nelson. Thanks so much, John. I'm now joined by NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Thank you so much for joining us. This is, we're so, so very close. NASA has so many decades worth of great relationships in the private sector with the commercial sector. Is this a winning strategy for the future? I know NASA is looking now further than LEO into the, going to the moon and even further. What does this look like going further and what are we building on? It's the new era of the golden age of space adventurism. Uh, we go back to the moon, for example, not only with our commercial partners, and you know, the two landers will be built by commercial uh, companies, but we also go back to the moon with our international partners. And that's quite uh, a difference from a half century ago when we first went to the moon. And that's the way that our space flight is in low Earth orbit as well. Look at the international cooperation on the space station. Look at now the commercial operation on the space station as evidenced by this flight here today. This moment really is that culmination of that international partnership, private, commercial, all of these things building on each other. How important is this for NASA to develop these commercial partnerships and, and across varying fields? I mean, Axiom Space, of course, building the Axiom Station. We're working on the suits that will be worn uh, on the moon by the Artemis crew. How important are these partnerships for NASA? Well, it's essential. We want to get out of low Earth orbit. We want to go and explore the cosmos. Uh, and so the more that we can bring commercial business off the face of the Earth up to low Earth orbit and, for example, replace the International Space Station when it ages out in 2030 with a commercial space station that then we can become a person who rents space right. to train our astronauts before we send them out to the moon oh. and on to Mars. Uh, or the business aspect, pharmaceutical research, pharmaceutical production, uh, all kinds of different research utilizing the properties of microgravity in space. So you're seeing the Axiom Station as an expansion of the 
the area that is available to do this work and this dynamic shift between NASA and organizations like Axiom Space really offers something new to the landscape. This really is the, the next golden age, isn't it? Well, and Axiom is one of several that are now uh, with incentive money from NASA building their concepts of a space station for low Earth orbit. And I am certainly hopeful that they are going to be successful and that increasingly as they do research in space, they're finding out that there's a business case yes. in order that they can actually have a profitable business. Well, that's what we're looking forward to, and we're looking forward to just this great moment as we build these partnerships, these relationships. Thank you so much for, for having us here and for being part of this broadcast and sharing this wonderful moment for all of our organizations, SpaceX, Axiom Space, NASA, working together as usual, right? Thank you so much. Thanks so, so much, Senator. Thanks for joining us. As go we, AX3. Go AX3, that's right. As we charge towards Terminal Countdown to launch, Michael Lopez Alegria, today's commander, has a special message for his crew, let's take a look. Man, I am excited. We are getting very close. As we get to these last few minutes, I wanna make sure we take a second to thank the training teams that got us here to prepare this very professional team of astronauts to go to the International Space Station on this very historic mission. First, the NASA teams, both at Johnson Space Center in Houston and at Marshall and Huntsville, Alabama. Then to our international partners, ESA at the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, Germany, and SCUBA near Tokyo in Japan. Um, and the Axiom team, whose help really was important when it got down to training for all the payloads that we'll be doing, over 30 experiments, as I think you've heard. So we're excited and very thankful to all those guys, but last but not least, to the folks in whose very capable hands we find ourselves right now, that's SpaceX. Uh, thanks to everybody. Without you, we couldn't have been here. Now let's go do it. Great view of our AX3 crew there, strapped in and ready for liftoff just over 10 minutes from now. Dragon SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon, the displays are so configured and uh, do you mind if I say a few words here, Jake? MLA, I do not mind at all. You've got the floor. So first I want to thank uh, our partners who had the vision and the conviction to help Axiom open access to humans uh, to low Earth orbit. And they are the Italian Air Force and its various ministries of its government, the Space Technologies Research Institutes of Turkey, Tubitak, and the Turkish Space Agency and its ministry, as well as the Swedish National Space Agency in tandem with ESA. And I also want to thank the team. If you're listening to this through an earpiece sitting in Hangar X and Launch Control or in Hawthorne and Mission Control, you're on the team. And the same is true of people who will be sitting at those consoles and consoles just like them and uh, Mission Control in Houston and the Payload Operations and Integration Center in Huntsville. Same is true for all the trainers that helped us get uh, where we are today with the crew ready to launch. And of course, the engineers, technicians, managers, and executives who over decades designed, assembled, and are now operating the most complex vehicle in the world that we have the privilege to go visit. Same is true for the visionaries who conceived and developed this amazing rocket that we're sitting on and the beautiful and capable capsule that we're sitting in. And if you're in the Rescue Ops Center, you guys are on the team. And of course, so are our friends and families who have given us their love and support from the very first step of this journey. And last but not least, the team at Axiom Space, the people who have poured their blood, sweat, and tears into this. So the four of us that are lucky enough to man the good ship Freedom at this point, are humble to be on the team. We're grateful to our teammates, and we are go for launch. Plus ultra. Copy all, Mike. As we just ticked through T minus eight minutes, I'll let you know you've got a whole bunch of people rooting for you here, and indeed all over the world. 
Godspeed, Axiom 3. Some really nice words there coming to us from Commander Michael Lopez Alegria. Uh, we are now approaching seven minutes until liftoff of the AX3 crew. The next event that we'll hear is that stage one engine chill has begun. Engine chill has started. And just on time, that call out tells us that we are now flowing a little bit of the super chilled liquid oxygen through the engines, through those turbo pumps to help bring the temperature down of that hardware. This helps us to reduce any chance of thermal shock whenever the full flow of that super chilled liquid oxygen uh, flows into the engines. Locks load continues for Falcon 9. We are fully Stage one, RP1 load is complete. So good call outs there that we have completed loading RP1, which is a highly refined type of kerosene on board stage one of Falcon 9. You've got that great view on your screen. As we mentioned earlier, Falcon 9 is an RP1 and liquid oxygen fueled vehicle. So LOX fueling continues on the vehicle on both the first and second stage. Blue skies there at the launch site. We're launching out of pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. We are 60% go for those weather conditions, which we're always keeping an eye on around the Florida um, airspace. Next event that we have coming up is the uh, terminal count for Dragon. This involves a, uh, a couple of things, but primarily just means that Dragon will be transitioning to uh, internal power. Great view there of the Dragon capsule, as well as the Dragon trunk, which is the unpressurized section just below the, the pressurized section, which of course is where we have the crew sitting. Propellant remains underway. We are completely loaded with all of our RP-1, that rocket grade uh, kerosene. We're still underway. Falcon 9 tanks are pressing for Stromback retract. Dragon is in configure for terminal count. So like Kate mentioned, we are heading into terminal count and Falcon 9 is ready for that configuration. We also just heard the call out that the Falcon 9 tanks are pressurized for strong back retraction. The strong back is that white structure you see to the right of the vehicle right now. That's used not only to connect the vehicle's umbilicals, but also as a structural support system. The strong back is retracting? Up until it begins to retract, which we just heard the call out for here. That's the mechanism we use both to move the rocket out to the launch side and pull it into its vertical orientation ahead of launch. We now can, we'll keep, we keep an eye on those. it as it retracts slightly here on your screen. We'll be able to see those clamp arms begin to open. And there they are now. And then that strong back will retract a couple degrees away. It will retract even further upon ignition of the engines to clear the way for Falcon 9's ascent. As I mentioned before, RP-1 is completely loaded onto the vehicle. We're still loading liquid oxygen onto the first and second stage. And obviously some happy cheers as the crowd is growing outside of Mission Control Hawthorne, as you see there on your screen. It's always awesome to have uh, an astronaut launch, but especially one during the day. <laughs> Stage one locks load is complete. With that confirmation, we know that stage one is fully loaded. Team is thrilled to hear that news behind me. At liftoff stage one, combined between that RP1. Dragon is in terminal count and is on internal power. There is confirmation that Dragon is on internal power and headed into the final minutes of our countdown.
as I was saying earlier at liftoff, Falcon 9 will be burning nearly 700 gallons of fuel per second. Great views there too of our crew inside Dragon, awaiting liftoff just over two minutes from now. We're now standing by for completion of locks load on the second stage. Just topping off. And there's that call out. And more cheers from our crowd here in at Hawthorne, California. Dragon is in auto idle. Confirmation there that Dragon is in auto idle. Wow, great view of 39A on your screen right there as we head toward launch. Gas close up and started. Expect loud venting. Call out to our crew there that loud venting is expected. Falcon 9 is in startup. There's that confirmation. Dragon is in countdown. Confirmation that Falcon 9 is in startup and Dragon is in countdown, which means that the vehicles are now controlling the final seconds as we lead up to liftoff. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. And there's confirmation from our flight director. Go for launch. We are go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 15. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition, engine full power, and the stop. So action three. Stop time is making that range. Further beyond, opening the door for more to follow. Godspeed AX3. Stage one propulsion is now on. If you are just joining us, this is the launch of the Axiom 3 launch to the International Space Station. Those incredible views on your screen, and there's our first shot of the AX3 crew inside Dragon on Ascent. Now, in just a few seconds here, we should hear the call out that Falcon Not 9. Power and telemetry. Stage one throttle down. There's that call out that Falcon mm -hmm. 9's engines are throttling down to help us pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure during ascent. Max Q. There's that call out for Max Q. Falcon 9 is supersonic. And that Falcon 9 is going faster than the speed of sound. Now, at this point, we will begin to throttle Falcon 9's engines back up. Stage one throttle up. There is that call out for mission control as well, as our AX3 crew continues on their way to space. We're now T plus one minute and 32 seconds into flight. The next event we have is MVAC chill, similar to what- MVAC chill underway. There's that call telling us that, again, we're flowing a little bit of that super chilled liquid Stage oxygen. Stage one Bravo. Copy one Bravo. That call there was one of the abort mode call outs that uh, the crew is calling out as they are uh, making their ascent on Falcon 9. Now, we're less than uh, 30 seconds or a few seconds away from four events that will happen in rapid succession. Main engine cutoff, or MECO, as it's there on the bottom of your screen, stage separation, ignition of the first stage engine, and the first stage's boost back burn. Stage one throttle down. That call telling us that the engines are beginning to thr throttle down Miko. Stage separation confirmed. 
SpaceX Dragon Zero. Some loud, loud cheers here as we can see that the first, one boost back startup. first and second stages have separated. A beautiful view there. The brighter light is the second stage under power of the MVAC engine. That first stage booster is now heading back toward the Florida coast. One thing I love about daylight launches is we're going to get some amazing views. We should be able to see the Space Coast come back into view as the first stage gets closer and closer to uh, landing zone one. Note that that first stage is actually still coasting to its apogee. So it's uh, about, as you can see there on your screen, 114, 115 uh, kilometers above the Earth's surface. And it's going to keep coasting for a little bit. Beautiful view there on the right-hand side of your screen of that Stage MVAC one, engine. Back, shut down. All right, that boost back burn has concluded on the first stage. Everything looks nominal with the second stage uh, trajectory. Everything also looking Dragon, good. SpaceX trajectory nominal. Everything looking good on the first stage as well as we see those grid fins begin to deploy. Now the next two major events we're tracking for the first stage, which right now is on the left-hand side of your screen, is going to be the entry burn at about T plus six and a half minutes, where we'll light three of Falcon 9's first stage, en stage engines, followed shortly thereafter by the landing burn at T plus seven minutes and 32 seconds, which will be a single engine burn to bring us back to landing zone one at Kennedy Space Center. Great view there of our crew on board and you can, of course, always keep an eye on their telemetry down in the bottom, bottom corner of your screen. At this point, we should be just about a minute and a half away from that entry burn Dragon, start. SpaceX trajectory nominal. Good call outs there that we continue on a nominal trajectory with Dragon. SpaceX Dragon, we come. And acknowledgement from the crew. These are incredible views on your screen right here. Again, the left-hand side of your screen is stage one, making its way back to Florida. And stage two, you see that MVAC engine burning, taking our AX-3 crew to orbit. That entry burn we're waiting on here is going to be a relatively quick burn. And what we're doing with our first stage is effectively scrubbing off some of that velocity as we come in for landing. Dragon, SpaceX, trajectory nominal. That's a nominal trajectory for Dragon as we continue to SpaceX orbit. Dragon, we copy. Again, confirmation from the crew. And we are expecting about two and a half more minutes from that second engine burn. Stage one entry burn startup. Stage one entry burn shutdown. As we heard the call out, that entry burn has concluded. The next burn will be the landing burn. As I mentioned before, we're heading back to landing zone one. We're gonna come through the clouds right now. Dragon, SpaceX, trajectory nominal. Everything continues to look nominal for, SpaceX, Dragon, we copy. for the second stage there on the right-hand side of your screen. These views really are breathtaking. Uh, such clear, crisp views of both the first stage on the left and the second stage on the right. Right through with these clouds should be uh, our first view once again. There it is. Just like magic, we see landing zone one. Crowds cheering here at SpaceX Mission Control Hawthorne as we tune in to see if we stick the landing.
And if you couldn't tell by the loud cheers, we did. We did Thank stick. You, FTS has saved. We did stick that landing. Falcon 9 has landed once again. But turning our attention back to the crew, as you see there, our next event is second engine cutoff, uh, or SECO, as it's referred to there at the bottom of your screen. Second stage will coast for a few minutes until Dragon is commanded to separate. A lot of the, just the energy here as SpaceX mission control is buzzing. You can hear commentary behind us. Right now, the crew is experiencing about three Gs. Uh, so pretty much a roller coaster um, for those thrill seekers out there. Stage twos and terminal guidance. And we are about 20 seconds away from that second engine cutoff. MLA will know this, uh, this feeling very well, this experience of going from now almost four Gs to... Next Dragon Shannon. To... Uh, Copy Shannon. As another abort mode there being called out. Now standing by for a second engine cutoff. Invect shutdown. Dragon SpaceX, you're in an normal orbit. There we heard those call outs of second engine shutdown and nominal orbital insertion. Launch escape system disarmed. And the disarming of our launch escape system. That of course means that our AX3 crew is getting their first experience here in microgravity. Right now, Dragon is performing a series of onboard checks to ensure that we're ready to begin actuating those Draco maneuvering thrusters on board the vehicle. Now, as we prepare for Dragon separation, we should have a great camera view here in just a couple of minutes. Oh, wow, and beautiful views of the Earth and our MVAC engine up there in orbit as well. Use there as we await that separation. Absolutely incredible images that we are getting back from up in space as we await dragon separation in just about a minute. More views there of our AX3 crew on board Dragon. We are now just about 30 seconds away from that anticipated Dragon separation. Starting to see the crew there play a little bit with the fact that they are operating in microgravity. And a great shot of mission control here in our headquarters at Hawthorne, California. This camera view here is taking a look uh, at Dragon. What we're waiting for is nose cone deployment, among other things, which as Kate mentioned earlier, there we go. Dragon separation confirmed. As you can see, Dragon has separated from the second stage. A pretty cool view here looking up at the heat shield that will return the AX3 crew back to Earth in just about two weeks. So this is our first view of AX3 flying free.
The next physical change that we will see uh, will be the deployment of the nose cone. That will take. Craig, this is the uh, SpaceX uh, Falcon team. We want to congratulate and congratulate you on a great ride to orbit. I think you're demonstrating the ultimate in reuse: a reused commander, a reused Dragon, and a reused Falcon, or maybe flight experience is a better word. Enjoy space. And Axiom 3. No, there's been, uh, as I was saying, it's a team sport. Thank you, guys. And Axiom 3, this is your launch director here. Uh, Walter, Albert, and Marcus. Congrats. Welcome to your first flight on Dragon. Uh, Mike, on the other hand, welcome to the Dragon Frequent Flyer Club. I imagine you only have enough miles to qualify for platinum status after this flight. Godspeed, Axiom 3. Cheers. Mark, thanks to you and your team. We're very grateful up here. So some back and forth between the AX3 crew as well as uh, AX3 chief engineer, chief engineer Bill Gerstenmayer, who, um, oh, I heard the ping. That is our first Quindar tone of AX3. Um, fun fact, uh, Bill Gersenmayer was actually chief engineer on AX-1, which is the mission that MLA was also commander of. So um, if you want to talk about reuse, <laughs> we also have some reuse on our side as well. Um, we also heard some nice words from launch director Mark Soltis. Uh, so just some really nice communication from both the Falcon team and the Dragon team to the AX-3 crew. And with that, our AX-3 crew is in orbit and on their way to the International Space Station. Obviously, great views of the crew there. And now Mission Control, again, that's... SpaceX Dragon. Jake, any chance you could uh, encode one of the centerline cameras we could watch the nose call? The crew's getting right into it. I love it. Dragon, we copy on the request. And Dragon, we expect that will automatically happen in the state machine here imminently. So with that, we are going to throw it back over to... We see to Hook's still traveling. Okay, we should stand by. Great views there of our crew, again, on their way to the International Space Station. And already getting right down to the business of operating Dragon. You can still see a huge number of our team gathered behind Mission Control. Dragon SpaceX, we see nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts and confirmation that we're getting nominal checkouts of those Draco thrusters on board Dragon. Got the check, and for your awareness, we have uh, visors open. Crew are well, feeling well. Copy, great news. So for those of you that have just recently tuned in, AX3 is in space. The crew is experiencing their first taste of microgravity. Here is a view of our MVAC engine, which has been shut down. Um, the crew has actually separated away from the second stage, which is where that MVAC engine is located. We are standing by for nose cone deployment. This takes a few minutes to complete as there are two sets of hooks that uh, need to be opened independently of each other. Uh, by deploying the, the nose cone, we are able to expose the docking mechanism, which is of course what the crew will utilize, uh, or excuse me, what Dragon will utilize to autonomously dock with the International Space Station. Overall, it was a pretty smooth flight all the way through countdown to liftoff. We're now approaching uh, 17 and a half minutes into flight.
Once again, the next milestone will be to deploy the nose cone. This is the basically the last physical change that Dragon will undergo in order to begin its journey. Well, not really begin, it's already on the way, but in order to be ready for its approach to the International Space Station. All right, so it's hard to see at the moment because the camera is still close to the hardware, but this is the nose cone opening. Slow and steady wins the race. Of course, when you're, when you're in space, every action has an opposite and equal reaction. So for uh, very good reasons, we don't just fling the thing open. It's very slow and steady. Again, this allows us to expose the docking mechanism the hardware that will be utilized to dock with the International Space Station. That hatch, which is the forward hatch, uh, will then be opened, and that's how the crew will get in and out of Dragon while it is up at the space station for the next two weeks. So that side hatch, which is where we saw the crew, or um, technically they were already in by the time that we uh, started our broadcast, but the crew did ingress Dragon today uh, just a couple hours ago through that side hatch, that remains closed. That won't open again until they are safely back on Earth on our recovery ship. So this nose cone that we see here slowly being opened is basically uh, opening the first part of a multi-system door <laughs> for them to get in and out of the International Space Station. I mentioned before that that docking is autonomous. That means that Dragon does the steering itself. Um, our pilot, uh, Walter Villade, has uh, the training and the capability to take control if necessary. Uh, but nominally speaking, Dragon is uh, flies on autopilot. It, it does the thinking and the calculation uh, itself. Which at, in, at the end of the day is ultimately much safer uh, than human steering as uh, you know, there's more um, that humans are prone to error because we are human. So that's a live view there of SpaceX Mission Control Center here at uh, SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. It is in the middle of our work day, so <laughs> uh, of course many folks have returned to their positions, their desks, their, their job and uh, they are continuing to do what we do best, and that's build spacecraft and uh, rockets and send people to space, just like we have done today. So with that, uh, let's check in over with Courtney, who is standing by at the ISS Mission Control Center in, in Houston. Uh, Courtney, how are things looking over there? It's over to you. Hey, Kate, everything is great. What a beautiful launch today. And with today's successful launch of AX3, the teams at NASA's Johnson Space Center will be monitoring Dragon's flight to the International Space Station over the next 36 hours. NASA's role in this journey really kicks in at a period called Integrated Operations, where Dragon is much closer to the station. At this point, NASA, SpaceX, and Axiom space teams are all in lockstep to get the crew safely docked. The teams here are preparing for a dock of AX3 to the station on Saturday morning. For now, that will be it from us in Mission Control Houston, and we'll be back with you Saturday for docking. And for now, we'll send it back to you, Kate and John. Thanks, Courtney. And we did hear that we had nominal uh, opening of the nose cone, so that is great news. Yeah. Now, over the next 30 hours, 30-plus uh, hours, really, Dragon will execute a series of burns to gradually raise and line up the AX3 crew for docking with the International Space Station in what we refer to as the activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. In just a few minutes, the crew will change out of their spacesuits and get a little bit more comfortable for flight and uh, something that would be my favorite part, enjoy their first meal right. aboard the spacecraft. Over the course of their flight, they will have a rest period that will last for about eight hours. Before they arrive at the space station, we will have two potential opportunities to chat briefly with the crew on orbit, one around 3.15 p.m. Pacific and another around 6.20 p.m. Pacific. Dragon SpaceX, environments look good for suit doffing and the cabin camera is soon to be configured, your go for suit doffing. 
we will put 4.012 in work. All right, so that call out there just saying that the crew is clear to take off their suits. As I had mentioned, they're able to get a little bit more comfortable for the upcoming journey. Now, we were talking about some on-orbit opportunities to chat with the crew. While we are hopeful that one of those opportunities will work out, neither opportunity is guaranteed as they are, unfortunately, dependent on both crew schedule and ground station coverage. However, if we are able to support, we'll make an announcement on our social media channels no later than 15 minutes before the event start time. In the meantime, be sure to keep tabs on the mission at axiomspace.com, and you can also track... And Dragon cameras are external. You can also track Dragon's flight on spacex.com slash launches. Right, like you mentioned, Kate, even if we aren't able to talk live with the crew, we will continue to provide updates on the mission across our social media channels. And then, as Dragon and the AX-3 crew approach the International Space Station early on the morning of January 20th, we will pick back up with our live joint coverage of the AX-3 crew's docking to station with NASA. So please keep an eye on Axiom and SpaceX social channels for updates, as there will be plenty of incredible moments to share with you over the course of their mission. So from all of us at Axiom Space, thank you SpaceX, thank you NASA, and thank you for tuning in. This is just the beginning, and we hope to see you soon.